Good afternoon. My name is Cleo Samuel, and I am a PhD candidate in health policy within the Harvard Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. Today, we are fortunate to have with us Michelle Rhee, the founder and CEO of Students First, a grassroots movement that seeks to mobilize parents, teachers, students, and administrators throughout the country in an effort to bring about meaningful results in education reform at both the local and national levels. For the last 18 years, Ms. Ree has worked tirelessly to ensure that children are equipped with the knowledge and skills they will need to compete in a changing world. As a former Teach for America Corps member in Baltimore City, she gained a tremendous respect for the hard work that teachers do every day and learn the lesson that would motivate her mission for years to come. That teachers are the most powerful driving force behind student achievement in our schools. On June 12, 2007, Washington DC Mayor Adrian Fenty appointed Ree as Chancellor of the District of Columbia Public School System, a school district serving more than 47,000 students across 123 schools. Under her leadership, the worst performing school district in the country became the only major city system to see double digit growth in both their state reading and state math scores across seventh, eighth, and 10th grades over three years. Ms. Ree currently serves on the advisory boards for the National Council on Teacher Quality, the National Center for Alternative Certification, and Project REACH of the University of Phoenix's School of Education. She has a bachelor's degree in government from Cornell University and is a Harvard alum holding a master's degree in public policy from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Michelle Ree. And now I will turn the program over to Dr. Ian Lapp. Thank you. Thank you, Cleo. Welcome to Decision Making Voices from the Field. Today is both a historic day that we have the Honorable Michelle Ree here, but this is also the 20th installment of the Voices series. Through this journey in the leadership studio here at the Harvard School of Public Health, we've had Harvard presidents, advisors to the President of the United States, health ministers, governors, directors of the CDC, directors of the World Health Organization all engaged in conversations with our students, our faculty, and our staff on what it means to lead. The goal of the leadership series is to enhance the decision-making knowledge of our students and to challenge all of us to face some of the most challenging health problems and social problems that we face today and face down the road. When we talk about leadership in education, up at the top of the list these days is that of our guest today, Michelle Ree. Welcome back to Harvard. Thank you. But I want to take the journey back. What's fascinating about Ms. Ree's journey is it actually, I think, as we were talking earlier, begins in college. As noted by Cleo, she was a graduate of Cornell. It was during those seminal years at Cornell that another movement in education launched by Wendy Koop Teach for America began. Upon graduating from Cornell in 1992, she left to go to Baltimore and for three years was part of Teach for America. Came back from that experience to join us here at Harvard, and during year two of that experience, had a seminal lunch with Wendy Koop about what needs to be done next. And from that lunch was the launching of the New Teacher Project. And for those who are doing the math here, uh, this is all at the age of roughly 25, 26 years old, that she would launch her own uh, major national movement, five years out of Cornell, upon graduating here from Harvard. 10 years later, as noted by Cleo, she would be tapped to be the chancellor of the Washington, D.C. school system. and. A year ago this month, celebrating the anniversary of her latest initiative, Students First. What a journey it's been. Yes. 
Michelle, I thought maybe you might take us a little bit through that journey and how your thinking about leadership and decision making has evolved over this 20 year journey from your days at Cornell to uh, the greatest heights that you are at these days. Sure. Um, so first, thanks for having me. Uh, as I was thinking about what might be helpful to you all as you're uh, engaging in your careers, um, I, I think that um, probably my experiences in DC would be most relevant. So I'm going to talk for a little while uh, just about um, that experience, sort of some of the things that I learned about leadership and decision making through that, and then hopefully we can engage in a, in a conversation. Um, so my journey in DC actually started in uh, in 2006 when a young, uh, pretty pretty unknown mayoral candidate named Adrian Fenty decided that he was going to run to become mayor of Washington DC. Um, he garnered uh, no endorsements, um, got very very few uh, campaign contributions, didn't participate in the debates, um, but his. He, he really believed that he was going to win. And his theory was that um, if he went out into the community and talked to people, that that would uh, usher him into office. And so uh, urban legend has it that he knocked on uh, about half of the doors in Washington, D.C. And, um, and it actually worked. Uh, he swept into office in November uh, of 2006. He was the youngest mayor ever to be elected in the city, the only mayor ever to be elected, winning every single precinct in the city. And um, uh, what he said about his time campaigning was that in every single household that he went into, it didn't matter which corner of Washington, D.C. it was in, that one thing was at the tip of everybody's tongue and at the top of everyone's mind, and that was, you, you've got to fix the schools. You've got to fix the schools. He just heard that refrain over and over and over again. So when he came into office, uh, his first act uh, as mayor was to introduce legislation to the city council that would allow him to take over mayoral control of the schools. And then for four months, uh, he lobbied the city council to pass that legislation that actually passed in uh, April of 2007. And then in, uh, in, in um, June of 2007, as his first act of having control of the school district, he, uh, he decided to announce me as his pick to become the city's first school's chancellor. Now, I was a 37-year-old Korean girl from Toledo, Ohio, who had never run a school, much less a school district. So I was the diametric opposite of what people were both expecting and wanting in a school's chancellor. So uh, when he announced me, the sentiment through the entire city was pretty much, what on God's green earth is Adrian Fenty thinking? And that was pretty much what I was thinking in my first couple of days in office, because this was no ordinary school district to take uh, control of. At the time, it was known as the lowest performing and most dysfunctional school district in the entire nation. Um, just to give you a, a few data points around that, because uh, you've got to wrap your head around it, um, let me share a few things with you. First of all, uh, if you were a, uh, a child entering into ninth grade, in our school district, the chances that you would uh, someday graduate from college were about 9%. Uh, of all of the eighth graders in the city schools, only 8% of them were on grade level in mathematics, 8%, which means that 92% of our young people did not have the skills and knowledge necessary to be productive members of society. And, uh, if, um, and the achievement gap that existed between white and African-American students in the city was about 70 percentage points. Uh, and probably the most disheartening data of them all was about our little ones. And what that data said was that when children came into our school system as kindergartners, they essentially were on par with kids who looked like them in other cities across the country. So cities like Boston or Sacramento or Memphis across the nation. The problem was that the longer that they stayed in our district, the worse off they were. So by the time they were in the third grade, they were far below their urban counterparts. And this is a very interesting statistic. Uh, the poor black fourth graders in New York City were operating two full grade levels ahead of the poor black fourth graders in Washington, D.C. 
So for everyone who wanted to blame the low academic achievement levels of our children on single parent households and violence in the community and lack of health care, et cetera, uh, what I would say was, well, the last time I checked the poverty in Harlem did not look all that different from the poverty in Southeast Washington, DC, but the kids in Harlem are two grade levels ahead of ours. So that gives you a sense of just how incredible the need was in our school system because it essentially meant that if you were a kid in our city, you were almost better off staying home every day than you were coming to school where you were almost certain to fall behind. So that's what I inherited. It was a huge task. Um, I learned a tremendous amount. I made mistakes every single day. Um, but if I had to think about the three lessons that I would want to impart to, to folks like you, uh, they would be three simple ones. So the first one, um, is uh, one that was actually uh, imparted to me by Joel Klein, who was then the chancellor of the New York City Public Schools. So Joel was the one who got me into this mess. He uh, recommended me uh, to Fenty to begin with, and so he always felt a little responsibility you know, to, to take care of me while I was in this job. So I remember uh, in my first few months in office, when things were really starting to heat up. Uh, I remember driving home one night, it was very, very late at night, it was raining, uh, and my cell phone rings and it's Joel Klein. So I pull over and I pick up the phone and I said, yes, sir, what can I do for you? And he says, how you doing? Uh, you know, because he was starting to hear the, 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 the murmurings and I said, I am doing okay. And he said, so um, I have uh, two things I wanna talk to you about tonight. I said, okay, what's the first one? He said, um, my first question to you is, do you have a boyfriend? <laughs> and I said, no, sir, I don't. And he said, OK, then you need to go out and get one. <laughs> and I, I never thought that I would be taking love life advice from Joel Klein. I said, OK. And he said, let me tell you why. He said, this is one of the loneliest jobs that you can possibly have. And you need a mate at home. Uh, because if you don't have that you know, support mechanism, you're, you're going to be lost. He's like, you, know, you need somebody at home who's going to say to you at the end of these tough days, you know, honey, it, don't worry about anything. You know, it's going to be fine. You're not the crazy. They're the crazy ones. You are good, right? He's like, if it wasn't for my wife and having that every day, I don't know what I'd do. So my first piece of advice is go out and find a boyfriend. I said, OK. Uh, easier said than done. Um, I said, so what's your second piece of advice? And he said, you have to lead from the front. And I said, OK. And he said it with such conviction that I was sort of embarrassed that I didn't actually know what it meant and I didn't want to ask him. So I said, okay, I got it. Thank you so much. And I hung up the phone. I was like, I have no idea what that means. Um, and it wasn't actually until uh, a few weeks later that I was going through this entire process to close schools, right? Uh, we were running far too many schools in the district, 144 schools for only about 50,000 kids, uh, which meant that we were paying to light, heat, and air condition a bunch of half-empty buildings. And it just wasn't a good utilization of resources. So I had to go through this process to identify about 23 schools. That was 15% of the schools in the district for closure. And um, uh, for those of you who are in public health, you don't know this about schools, but uh, if you ever want to become the least popular person in a city, all you have to do is tell someone that you're closing a school, much less 23 schools. So that's the situation that I was in. Um, and it was interesting because I knew that this was the right thing. I knew that we had to make this decision as a district. And yet, uh, the, the, the district actually had avoided doing this for, uh, for years and years and years, even though people knew that it was the right decision to make. And when I went through that turmoil, I understood. I was like, OK, now I get why nobody wanted to do this, because it is a huge you know, uh, 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 pain. I mean, basically, I had people protesting me and picketing my office and all this sort of stuff. Um, so. Uh, what was interesting to me is we moved forward very aggressively because we knew that that was the right thing to do for the district. And um, the following school year, I was in one of the schools that, was, that had been consolidated with another school. And uh, uh, a woman came up to me and she said, hey, 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 you recognize me? You recognize me? She's like, I was the one that was always screaming at you at all the community meetings. I said, oh, I know who you are. I could never forget that face. And she said, I just want to let you know that you were right. She said, I, we couldn't see it at the time because it was a very emotional process for us. We didn't want our school closed down. It was, it was very sentimental to us. She's like, but now we're in this new school and we, we have better programs and uh, you know, better facilities. And so now I understand why you made that decision. 
And it, it, it struck me at that point what Joel Klein was talking about, about leading from the front. Because sometimes as, as a leader, you can see things that other people can't. And if you spend all of your time trying to make everybody happy and sort of you know leading from the middle, in the middle of all the muck, uh, you are not able to actually take the organization in the direction that you know it needs to go. So that's my first piece, lead from the front. Um, my second piece of advice is, uh, in order to be an effective leader, you have to be OK not being liked. And I can tell you this because I'm really, really good at this. Um, <laughs> it was, you know, as I was uh, going through my, my, uh, my tenure at, in Washington, DC, whether it was school closures or uh, you know, terminations of central office employees or what had you, have you, we, um, we did a lot of things that caused a tremendous amount of controversy. And I remember at one point, I think it was during my second year in office, uh, a, a Washington Post columnist wrote a piece about me. Uh, and he said, I like Michelle Rhee. I think she is doing good things for the schools. I just wish she would be a little nicer. And so I read the piece and I call the guy. I'm like, what are you, what are you, what are you talking about? And he said, um, well, here's the thing. He's like, I want you to be here for the long haul. Uh, I think you are good for the school district. But I'm afraid that unless you start to become a little nicer and friendlier, then people are just, you know, they're, they're going to push you out. And then you won't be here anymore. And that won't be good for the city. And I said to him, I said, look, you, got, you, um, you need to figure out what you believe uh, are the most important characteristics of a school's chancellor. Because if you, if you think you know, nice and accommodating is, is what this person needs to be, then you honestly should be advocating for my ouster. Because if you want warm and fuzzy, I am not your girl. I said, but if you like what we're doing and you, you think that the changes are important, then maybe what you should be advocating for is not for me to change my personality, but, but for people to, to shift their focus away from the personal stuff and onto what's most important, which is what kind of policies are we putting in place and what kind of results are we seeing for kids? Um, and it's very interesting to me because um, you know I got a lot of advice after that piece came out. And one of them was from a very well-known person in, in the Democratic Party. Uh, and I'm, I'm a Democrat, so you know I sort of had read about this guy. And he came up to me one day, and he said, I have a little unsolicited advice for you. And I said, OK, I'm ready. Uh, and he said, you've got to soften up, Michelle. It's like, soften, soften, soften. <laughs> he said, you are so hardcore all the time. I've seen your speeches. You talk about only 8% of the kids being on the grade level. And you're so harsh about everything. And he's like, and when you, know, you talk about the bad things, that makes people feel bad. And people don't want to feel bad, Michelle. People want to feel good. <laughs> so if you want more people to come on board with you, you just need to soften your approach up a little bit. And I looked at him and I said, I totally disagree with you. I said, I could, like you're saying, walk around all day and talk about you know, the, 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 the good things that are happening in the district. But the reality is that this school system is failing children every single day. I don't want to make people feel comfortable with that system. So if by sharing the data and talking about what's wrong, it makes people feel a little uncomfortable, but at the same time, it sparks the changes that we need, then I'm 100% OK with that. And I think that uh, if, if I look back at my time there, what, what people were often telling me was, if you want to have an easier go of it, you should be a little nicer. But it wasn't about me. And it, it couldn't have been about me in DC. I, I admit that if I wanted people to like me and that was the goal, I would have went about things 100% differently. But um, when you are in an organization that needs incredibly aggressive change very quickly, then I think the end goal has to be what drives your decisions. And that can't be about popularity. So I think that, that every leader has to, at a, at a certain level, be comfortable with not being liked. Um, so that's my second lesson. And then my third uh, quick um, tidbit for you is you can never assume who's going to be on your side when it comes to implementing tough change. Uh, and I say that being a very, very progressive, liberal, lefty Democrat. I mean, I was the girl in college who walked around with a button that said, you know, Bush, get out of mine. And a um, woman without a man is like a fish without a bicycle. I mean, it was, you know, I, you don't get more, uh, more liberal than I was. 
Uh, and yet today, I am in a situation where the vast majority of politicians who come to me every day wanting to work with me are really conservative Republicans. And it's just weird to me. I mean, I never would have thought that this would be the case. But but I'm going to tell you a quick story that, that sort of led me to, to this um, understanding. Uh, when I got to DC, um, I thought I knew exactly what education reform should look like and what it shouldn't look like and what policies we should put in place, et cetera. And where I tr drew a very, very bright line was around school vouchers. Right? Vouchers are when you take public funds and you allow kids to go to a private school with them. Uh, and I was against vouchers, as, as the vast majority of Democrats are, because of everything that our party said about vouchers. Well, it takes money away from the schools that need it the most, and you're only uh, allowing a handful of kids to you know, escape these circumstances. What about the rest of the kids, et cetera? So I was very much against vouchers. I got to DC, and there was a publicly funded voucher program in place, and it was up for reauthorization. And people wanted to know what my thoughts were on it. They said, we want you to weigh in. So I kind of knew what I thought, but I didn't want to make any snap decisions. So I decided to talk to people who were involved in the, the program to sort of figure out what it was about. It was fascinating to me because I had meeting after meeting after meeting with young mothers across the city who would come to me and say, OK, I, 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 I researched my neighborhood school, and I found out that only 10% of the kids at this school are on grade level which means my kid has a 90% chance of failure. That's not good enough for my daughter. So then I did the next thing that the school district told me to do, which is that she would apply through the out of boundary lottery process to try to see if she could get one of the spots at a really high performing school on the other side of town. She's like, I didn't win the lottery. So now I'm here in front of you and I need you to tell me, what should I do? And when I was sitting across the table from these mothers, looking at them eye to eye, knowing that I did not have a spot at a high performing school that was good enough for my own two daughters to put their kid at, I thought, oh my gosh, who am I to stop this mom from taking a $7,500 voucher, which by the way, was $2,000 less than what we were spending in the district, and potentially go to a Catholic school and get that kid a great education. So I was, I sort of had this epiphany. I was like, OK, I'm for the voucher program now. So I came out and I said, yes, vouchers. And people went nuts, right? The Democratic Party said, you're going against the party. And you know, people were like, well, why, why would you do this? This is, this is not to your benefit. You need to keep the kids in the system and keep the money in the system. And I said to them, here's the problem with your thinking. My job is not to defend and protect a system that is doing wrong by kids. My job is to make sure that every kid in the city gets a great education. I am agnostic as to the delivery mechanism. If it's through one of our traditional public schools, great. If it's through a char public charter school, wonderful. If it's through uh, a, a, a pr private parochial school through a voucher, I'm OK, as long as kids are getting the education that they need. Um, and so this whole sort of partisan divide of, well, this is a Republican idea and this is a Democratic idea, it doesn't work when it comes to public policy. Um, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine, one of my best friends, who's a, who's a public school teacher. And she said uh, to me, she's like, yeah, that whole voucher thing, she's like, I, I, I'm not with you on that one. And that's why I sort of explained you know, everything that I just explained to you. And she said, yeah, no. I'm still not with it. So I said to her, I said, OK, Waiting for Superman, did you watch the movie Waiting for Superman? She said, yes, I did. Uh, and I said, uh, so if you haven't seen the movie, it's a documentary about public education. Anyway, th there's this incredibly poignant scene at the end of the movie where this little girl named Bianca is looking out the window. She cannot go to her kindergarten graduation because her mother has fallen behind on the tuition payments. So she's crying, and why can't I go? So I said to my friend, Bianca in the movie, she can't go to her kindergarten graduation because her mom is, uh, can't pay the $500 in tuition, how did that make you feel? And she said, it was a travesty. It was an injustice. She said, I wanted to write the check myself. I said, right, honey, that would be a voucher, <laughs> just a different kind. Uh, so my point in all of this is you have to abandon your assumptions about who's going to be on your side and what policies you're actually going to advocate for. Because if we in this country uh, stopped thinking about things in terms of a Republican agenda or a Democratic agenda and just focused on what decisions were in the best interest of children, then we would have a radically different landscape. Um, so that's my last piece is, is don't make assumptions about either who you're going to work with or what you're going to work on behalf of. Thank you so much, sure. Michelle.
Um, so you've gotten a lot of advice during that journey in DC from sort of an e-harmony for, for uh, school <laughs> district leaders um, to advice from everybody, from parents uh, to uh, leaders in various different parties. Looking back, would you have done anything different? Um, well, I'm like I said earlier, I made a ton of mistakes. I made mistakes every day. Um, but what I would say is that every single one of those mistakes we learned from. Uh, and I think that was the most important piece. So I wouldn't necessarily say that I would have made this decision differently or that decision differently because we learned, we became better, and then I think we avoided those kinds of mistakes when, it, when the stakes were even higher. Um, if there was one thing that I'd said, what, that I would have to say we were weakest in, and I think this is important uh, for people to understand, is we were probably weakest in communication. Uh, because I was a wonky person, right? I, I knew all the policies that I wanted to implement, and I was a manager. I could make sure that they were executed well. And um, I thought that what we were doing was really obvious. Yes, I'm shutting down schools because we're going to be able to you know, have a better utilization of the money, et cetera, et cetera. And what I failed to realize was that they, the actions that we were taking actually weren't obvious to everybody out there. So they would see me closing down schools or firing teachers and the community become, you know, the neighborhoods becoming unhappy. Uh, and I wasn't out there effectively saying, I know that this is un, uh, you know, an unhappy time. I know that this is difficult for the, for the neighborhood to take, but this is why we are doing these things. I just thought that people knew everything that I knew um, and I was absolutely wrong in that. So if I had some piece of this to redo, it would be about, being a much more proactive uh, and effective communicator out to the public. Great, thank you. My guess is that our students have a fair number of questions. We'll take some questions from the audience. Okay, just wait for the microphone. We'll be right to you. Right up here. Hi. Uh, my name is Slava Rukiki. I'm in the health policy program as well in uh, GSAS. So thanks so much for talking to us. Sure. So I was wondering um, your thoughts on non-cognitive skills because um, there's been a lot of research lately on um, things that are not quantitative that um, predict success really well, such as humility and patience and resourcefulness. Um, and so your project, TNTP, um, recently gave an award to um, Jamie Irish and his, um, it seemed to me his philosophy is very much centered around um, beating this other school, Crush Lusher, um, with standardized test scores. And so I was wondering um, kind of your vision for the future of education um, in terms of the non-cognitive skills. You know, I think we as a country are in a much different place than we were 30 or 40 years ago, where uh, the, the, the purpose of schools was to teach kids skills in reading, writing, arithmetic. It was, it was pretty basic. And if you were a teacher, you stood up, you delivered the material, you were doing your job. And we are in a wildly different situation today. Uh, many of the children who came to school every day in the Washington, D.C. schools uh, were lacking um, some of the basic skills, uh, character and value skills that kids need to be successful members of society. Um, and so it, it did become our job to teach kids things like perseverance and discipline and hard work and you know what all of those things would amount to because without those things I don't think that that, that any any child can be successful um, so you know I think that uh, in many ways um, education reform debates have become very sort of polarized. It's either this or it's this, when in fact the answer is always somewhere in the middle, right? And so when it comes to uh, the idea of, well, do you, do you, do you, do you uh, put a heavy emphasis on you know math and science and reading because those are what's tested and then we want to see higher test scores, et cetera, um, should we be moving that direction? Yes. but. That does not mean that we should be doing that to the exclusion of everything else. Um, because every child, in my opinion, should have access to a broad-based curriculum. They should be learning about art, music, PE, values, character, the things that, that you're talking about. And there, it shouldn't be a situation where it's an either-or. 
Uh, we have to create school environments where all kids have access to every single one of those subject areas, and they, we have the resources to do it well. Yes, hello, my name is Jay Prompt. I'm an MBH student in environmental health. Uh, my question is regarding student creativity. I've been reading in the literature recently that there's a crisis of creativity in our country at all levels of education, elementary, secondary, post-secondary, and that's contributing to our nation's decline as a whole. Do you have any plan for enhancing the creative thought process in the student body? Uh, in your educational reform system? So I'd say this is another one of those things that tends to get polarized, right? So people, uh, education reform advocates who uh, who want to put strict accountability measures in place and want to ensure that kids are uh, learning at high levels, and they, those things can be measured by uh, by test scores, et cetera, uh, are often accused of, of killing the you know creativity of children and, and, and vice versa. And again, I just don't think that it, it can be either or. I think you've got to have both. And I think the answer to that is great teaching. Because if you go into the classroom of a highly effective teacher, they're not just doing drill and kill with the, t with the kids. I mean, in, in fact, we know that the most highly effective teachers out there uh, teach to to, to to ensure that kids really grow their higher order thinking skills, their analytical skills, the kinds of skills that are gonna ensure that the kids are thinking in a very creative way. And then the test scores come with that. Um, but uh, you know, it, it sort of can't be just sort of seen as one or another. I think that the, the whole creativity thing has to be about creating the right kind of environment where we are building critical thinkers and really good students who are asking a lot of questions and they're encouraged to do so and they're gaining academic skills and gaining the skills on, on the creative side simultaneously. Great. Michelle, if I can just jump in with a question. Taking a step back as you've, your thinking on education has evolved, there was also some very clear career decisions that you've made. So can you take us back a year or so ago to when you made the decision not to go into what many different choices you had after uh, your career as uh, DC um, head of the DC schools to make the decision to launch the program you did. Sure. What were some of the steps you made in terms of what's next for Michelle Ray? Yeah. So first of all, let me just say that I have never in my life been one of those people who ever knew what I wanted to do, ever. Uh, and I always envied people who in high school, they knew they wanted to be a doctor or a lawyer or something like that. I, when I graduated from high school, I had no clue where I wanted to go to college. I had no clue what I wanted to study. I went to Cornell just because I happened to get in. And uh, I majored in government because that's what everybody seemed to be majoring in. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do after that. So from one phase of my life to another, I've sort of fallen in to the next thing as opposed to it sort of being some grand plan. So for those of you who have no clue what you want to do, don't worry about it. Um, I think the most important thing is to pursue something that you feel really passionately about and that you see a very, very significant need for. That, I think, is the most important thing. And then the, the success and everything else will come with that. Um, when, I, um, when I was leaving DCPS, it was a really tough time for me because I loved that job. I mean, I, I, every single morning I woke up and I thought, I have the best job in the entire world. And so when it became clear that I wasn't going to be able to stay in the job any longer, I didn't have any clue what I was going to go off to do. Um, and my um, then fiance, now husband, uh, took me away on a vacation. This was literally uh, the, the day after Fenty lost the election, and you know, I was sort of at wit's end. Uh, he takes me away to Hawaii, and he says, you got to put everything away. No Blackberry, no phone, no computer, no email, no nothing. And you have to understand, for people like me and him, like, we never do that. So for three days, 
you know, we went kayaking and snorkeling and all this stuff. And um, after three days, he's like, okay, I can tell that you're about to have a conniption fit, so okay, you can check your emails. And <laughs> I, 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 you know, checking all my emails, voicemails, and all these people had been calling me, well, we want you to come and be the commissioner of education here, the superintendent here, come and, you know. And, uh, and he said, okay, I know how your brain works. You just want to pick the next thing and go. Uh, because I'm a sort of a very linear person like that. He's like, and, and we're not going to do that this time. We're going to talk to everybody. We're going to hear what all the options are. We're going to take our time, and then we're going to figure out what's right. And I had never gone through that kind of a process before, but it was actually very helpful to me to to not just jump into the next job, which is what I had always done uh, when, the, uh, when a great opportunity arose, but to really think about, well, why do you want to take that job or why don't you? What's right or wrong about that? And that's what led me to form Students First because what I realized was, you know what, I could be, go and become another superintendent or a state commissioner somewhere and I'm literally going to have the same problems all over again because the issue is that we don't have the right pu public policies in place in this country. We don't have the kind of politicians that are going to stand up to the unions and the other entrenched interests um, to change the political dynamic. So until we can change the political landscape in this country as it pertains to education reform, I could go to every, you know, 10 school districts after that and just keep knocking my head up against the wall. That's what needs to change, and so that's the most impactful thing that I can do. And I think that had I not have had the time to think about that, um, and my very wise husband to kind of guide me through that process, I'm, I probably would have just said, okay, that sounds really compelling. I'll just jump into that next thing. Great. Thank you. Another question from one of the students? Um, thank you very much, first of all, for being here, Michelle. Um, my name is Eric Seymour. I am an MPH student in the Health and Social Behavior Track and a 2005 Teach for America Corps member from the Mississippi Delta. So there's that. You feel my, you feel my pain. <laughs> um, uh, my question is to the point you were trying to make about teacher quality. Um, I think a lot of people agree that highly effective teachers are a very important component to the success of students. My question to you as a leader and as a policymaker is thinking about how to ensure that we have a well-trained, highly effective teacher force on the supply side. Um, how do we, like, what do we need to do in terms of teacher training in this country and how do we make that happen to ensure that we actually have really highly effective teachers? Okay, so we could probably have that discussion for an hour. Uh, but let me, let me be as, as quick as I possibly can. First of all, there should be no doubt in anybody's mind that teacher quality is of the utmost importance. And I say that because right now in this country, in some corners we are having these weird debates that are trying to argue otherwise. People saying, well, you know, children are coming from such difficult home environments and, and social circumstances that it doesn't matter what happens in the schools. Teachers can't, can't uh, make up for the, the, the challenges that kids face uh, on the home front. And I think that is absolutely wrong. Uh, now, when children come from challenging home environments, does that make an educator's life more difficult? Absolutely, 100%. We can't ignore those things. But does it mean that they can't be successful with those children? Absolutely not. Uh, in fact, a recent study that was put out about a year ago by, uh, by Harvard uh, professor showed that of all of the in-school factors that exist, teacher quality is the most important factor. And that if a child even has one highly effective teacher in their 12 years uh, schooling career, that it, it increases the likelihood that they'll graduate from high school, go on to college, graduate from college, make more money, uh, less likelihood of them having a teen pregnancy, et cetera. So it makes a huge difference. And that's why as a nation, I believe we have to be really focused on what policies can we put in place to ensure that every single child has an, a highly effective t teacher in front of them every single day. Um, now, unfortunately, what I would say is that my quest to make that happen has a, a weirdly become framed in some circles as anti-teacher. Well, you know, you're trying to blame the teachers for everything, you're trying to scapegoat teachers, you're, you're putting tremendous pressure on teachers, you're making them feel bad. I'm like, that's not, this is not an anti-teacher uh, crusade at all. It is a actually an acknowledgement of how incredibly important teachers are. And it's saying not everybody can be an effective teacher. Not, uh, not everybody can be in front of our kids because it is such an incredibly difficult job. Um, 
how do we make, make teacher training better? I, I'm still trying to deal with the K-12 world. The, the post-secondary world is even harder, I think, in some ways to make uh, change in. But I think at the end of the day, the biggest shift that needs to happen is a shift towards looking at everything through effectiveness. So if we were, were to go back to schools of education and say, we're going to track how effective your graduates are. And if they are not effective, then we're going to send them back to you. And you got to try again, because you know, you've sent us a faulty product. Um, I actually think that that would make sc uh, schools of education and, and, and uh, institutions of higher ed operate much, much more differently than they are now. Um, and in order to do that, quite frankly, we have to put in place a rigorous and comprehensive teacher evaluation system. Because right now in this country, all teachers are being rated as effective. I mean, less than 1% of teachers are rated as ineffective. And even if when you're rated as ineffective, nothing happens to you. You can stay in the classroom year in and year out. Um, and so until we have a rigorous uh, teacher evaluation system that begins to differentiate between teachers, uh, then I think that we are going to have a complete inability to move in the direction of actually saying how how can we how can we move more of the teacher force to be on on, on the effective uh, side of the spectrum as opposed to the ineffective side. Unless you have some sort of measure of that, it's going to be impossible to put the things in place to measure whether or not you are are. Um, are moving in that direction. Hi, uh, thank you again for your sure. talk. Um, I'm Karen Bialum from the Department of Global Health and Population. And my question is, um, I was hoping that you could reflect a little bit on your position as a women leader and if you've had any challenges because of your um, sex and also your values. Um, if you could talk a little bit about that, that would be great. Yeah. Thanks. So it was, it, it was very interesting to me because um, I was uh, sort of painted as the dragon lady in DC, right? And so, you know, it was this harsh lady coming. And I think part of it actually had to do with the fact that I, I did not fall into sort of the stereotype type of, of what an Asian woman should be like, I don't know. Um, but even when the press covered me, right, so uh, a magazine wrote an article about me and she and it said, you know, in her slim black pants and Manolo Blahniks clicking across the thing. And I was like, you know, if I was a 55-year-old white guy, you would not be talking about what I was wearing or what my shoes looked like. You just, you, you, you wouldn't. And, and so I think there were some, perceptions about you know what I should be like and then when I didn't fit into that mold kind of you know cast as a as a certain uh, character um, I would say this though I was I was not trying to be anything I was just I was just being myself um, and in fact uh, somebody asked me the other day they said how did you uh, you know gain the skills to have such, t such a tough skin etc and I told the story about um, when we were going through the school closure process, my mother actually came to visit me in DC. So she comes, she lands in the city, uh, you know, she turns on the TV and there are just, you know, pictures, I mean, coverage of me with people throwing things at me at a meeting and, you know, protesting out uh, in front of the house. She's like, there's people out on the street and they feel very passionately about something. I said, yes, they're here to protest me. She's like, ugh. Um, she opens the Washington Post. There's this two page spread with pinpoint map of, you know, all the schools I was closing. So I get home that night at 11 o'clock after all these uh, school closure meetings and um, I'm making myself a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. My mother says, you know, she sort of tiptoes into the kitchen. She's like, are you okay? <laughs> I said, yeah, I'm fine, yeah. She's like, um, you know, when you were young, you never used to care what people thought about you. She said, and so I always thought that you were gonna grow up to be really antisocial. She said, I see now that this is serving you well. <laughs> and I said, yeah, you know, because it was about, um, it was about having a, a thick skin. I mean, people said a whole lot of things about me. Th people still say things about me every day. Uh, yesterday, my, my daughter commented, she's like, you know, I just, I don't like when people talk about you. And, just, and my other daughter says, oh, who cares? <laughs> you know, uh, so I do think that some of it is just about kind of being you you can't you can't try to be like somebody else you have to do what feels natural to you as a leader and whatever stereotypes or whatever about your gender or your race or whatever come into play it doesn't matter and I will say this when I was when I first got to DC people said 
the big the biggest question on people's mind was is a is a is a Korean American woman going to be able to relate to a largely African American population? Is this a dynamic that will work? So that was all the buzz the first couple of days. And I spent a lot of time out in the community after that. And what I found was that the moms that I talked to on a daily basis, uh, they said, we don't, we, we don't really care what color you are. You could be green for all we care. Just fix the schools and make the same decisions for our kids that you would for your own kids. And that was my commitment at that time. And I, I tell you that for you know, three and a half years, I never met a single parent anywhere in that city who wanted anything different for their kids than what I wanted for mine. And so that's the, the lens through which I tried to, to, to manage the entire city and to, and to lead the city schools was through that as a mom and as a parent as opposed to thinking about it from any other perspective. Great. Picking up on this, on this point, Michelle, you, do, you mentioned earlier about your metamorphosis on the thinking about communication. And that's been kind of the theme of this last response. Where are you at in terms of strategies about building coalitions, um, building a communication strategy? What is your latest thinking on that? Yeah. So I um, am often criticized because I gave this speech uh, halfway through my second year where I basically said, uh, collaboration is overrated. <laughs> and uh, you know, so that clip got blasted everywhere, and you know, I go places, and they said, "Well, she doesn't want to collaborate, and she says it's overrated." Um, but I actually meant what I said. Now, don't that clip is going to get uh, sent somewhere now? <laughs> but let, me, let me explain what I said. What I what I went on to explain in that was that uh, a culture had developed in the school system where the goal became collaboration and cooperation, which meant that in order to move forward on anything. Everything, everybody had to be on board, which meant that you met and met and met and had committee after panel after Blue Ribbon Commission on things. But very little got done because it took so long to get everybody to consensus and then you rarely can get everybody to consensus and so things would just sort of fizzle out. And so what I was saying was that when collaboration becomes the goal, then kids are in trouble. And in my view, we, in public education have been all too willing to turn a blind eye to the realities that are happening to children in the classroom every day in the name of harmony amongst adults. As long as we're all getting along, then we all feel good, right? I told you at the beginning of this uh, session that 8% of the kids were on grade level uh, in mathematics in the, in the Washington, D.C. public schools. But when I looked at the performance evaluations of the adults at the same time, 98% of them were being rated as doing an excellent job. How can you have that kind of a disconnect? So literally all of the adults in the system were like, yeah, we're doing good work, this is great. When, when we have, we're seeing 8% success for kids. So when harmony and cooperation and collaboration becomes the goal, then you can create a system where the children are being left behind. And that's what I was arguing against is, should you get input? Should you, should you try to you know, get as many people to weigh in as possible? Yes. But at the end of the day then, as a leader, you need to figure out what you believe is right and you need to move forward on it even though there may be pushback. Um, because if you're going to stop at every step along the way and say, well, if this person doesn't agree, then let me, then you just, I don't think, can move forward as aggressively as you need to. Uh, and quite frankly, and I keep saying this to people, uh, I challenge people all this all the time. If someone can show me an example, any time in history, any country, any, any, any uh, you know, um, sector, where you saw dramatic changes occur, where everybody was happy and on board, then I would tell everyone to follow that route. But I've just never seen it happen. Every important uh, shift that has occurred happens with some opposition to it. Um, and so that's my, that my only point, is that you've got you've to be ready to face <coughs> that opposition. You've got to be ready to lead uh, 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 in spite of that um, if you want really uh, aggressive and, and, and transformative change to come about. Thank you again for speaking with us. My name is John Sawyer. I'm in the Law and Public Health Program. And I was wondering if you could give me your thoughts on Race to the Top and what you, how you think about it as a mechanism for creating change. 
So I think Race to the Top was brilliant. For those of you who don't know what Race to the Top was, it was an Obama administration initiative where they took aside a, sm a relatively small portion of federal dollars. It was $4.3 billion. And they, instead of uh, pushing it out to districts through formula funding, which is typically what happens with federal dollars. They held it aside and said, this is money that we are going to give out based on how aggressive states are in their reform efforts. So they had this big competition where states had to apply. And you know, in the first round, they only chose two states. So it was very competitive. Um, and what I can tell you is that even the race to the top was not perfect in its execution or anything like that. It sparked more policy change and legislative change in this country as it pertains to education reform in a two-year period than any two-year period I think we've ever seen in this country. Um, so I thought it was brilliant as a, as a catalyst. We have time for one more question. Uh, thank you, Michel. Um, my name is Adebayo Waye, um, MPH student, healthcare management and policy here at Ava School of Public Health. Um, well, back again to the educational reform, I would just like to know, as regards teachers' um, evaluation, apart from students' performance, mm -hmm. what other ideal criteria will you kind of like advocate for, you know, to improve um, teacher quality? Yeah. So f let me first say that while student achievement growth mm -hmm. should be a significant part of any teacher's evaluation, it should not be the only measure of a teacher's uh, quality. Um, so we advocate for looking through multiple lenses uh, at, at a teacher's performance, one through how much their students grow academically. We also advocate for uh, uh, observations of classroom practice. So being in their classroom environment and seeing how they interact with kids, seeing how they've set up the environment, how they question children, et cetera. Um, we also advocate for there to be a team component, so how the school overall is doing, so that you have both uh, you know, individual and, and holistic dynamics, uh, and then also what we call contributions to school community, which is, you know, for the teachers who are, uh, you know, coaching the debate and the soccer teams and taking kids on field trips to, to college campuses, et cetera, that should count for something. But what I think is the most interesting development um, that has come about in the last couple of years, uh, and actually the students in DC told me this when I, um, I, I used to have a student cabinet made up of high school students from all throughout the city. And when we introduced, uh, we, we would always introduce to them any policy that we were going to put in place before we put it in place to get their feedback on it. So we introduced to them the, the teacher evaluation system. And we laid it all out and the kids said, um, yeah, this is okay, it's, it's good, uh, but what you're missing is us. Because even the, the, the people that come in to evaluate the teachers, they only see them you know, five times a year. We see them every day. So why wouldn't you want to get our opinions on this? Uh, so we had this whole big debate on the student uh, cabinet about it. And we finally decided uh, to, to do a pilot. And the kids ran it. They came up with their own questions, their own protoc survey protocols. They implemented it. They came back. They crunched the data. And it was interesting because there was this big debate. Uh, some of the kids in the group felt like uh, they, they said, their words, not mine, they said, you know, we have a bunch of knuckleheads in the school. And what if the knuckleheads, uh, because a teacher happens to be strict or give a lot of homework, then they, they rate that teacher lower when it's not actually a good reflection of how the, good the teacher is? So that was a question that the kids had. And when they got the data back, what they found was that even the knuckleheads uh, were able to differentiate in teacher to quality pretty accurately. Um, and in fact, the Gates Foundation did a study not too long ago that showed that there's a very high correlation between student input and, and teacher uh, effectiveness as well. And so that's another thing that, uh, that we'd advocate for being part of the, the entire equation. So Michelle, this is, on behalf of our student body, really been a phenomenal hour together. We have just one minute left. Uh, you've been accused of breathing fire <laughs> as much as you fired so many uh, in DC. But in this last minute, can you talk a little bit about hiring and what you look for as you've gone on your journey? It's really been a journey of learning how to lead and a number of times crash courses in that. What do you look for when you hire folks like our, our students um, in terms of the next generation of potential leaders like yourself? Yeah. So I, I've hired 
lots of Harvard grads. I've interviewed lots of, of Harvard folks. Uh, and it's interesting because I, fall, I find that they sort of fall into to different categories. Um, but one of the things that I, I, I just talked to the folks at the Kennedy School about was this. I said, um, I would like to see more people who have the orientation towards, I'm going to push, as an employee of an organization, I'm going to push for something that I feel like is the right thing, even though it might not be what my manager thinks is right or, or anything like that. And the reason why is this. I found that a lot of really, really smart and capable people are so afraid of getting in trouble, right, getting yelled at by their boss or being told that they're wrong or something like that, that they're very, very tentative. And uh, though those people can be very good executors, right, when they're given a project, go do it and they'll do it. Um, I, I, I don't think they're actually living to their potential because they're not as willing to sort of take risks and chances, even though it might not be successful. And yeah, you might get you know shot down or yelled at or whatnot. Not, but uh, that's how you grow as a person. Um, and so w I really look for that quality when I'm hiring people as the kind of person who is going to formulate not just a random idea, but something you know a very informed idea, and then um, have the guts to to advocate for it uh, and and you know be able to to argue with their colleagues and and uh, and want to put some Something in place and then be willing to to be accountable for what happens on the back end. Great, thank you. From one change agent to the next. <laughs> exactly. This is great. So please join me in thanking Michelle Ray. <laughs>